Hello and welcome to this lesson on induced fission, which is part of the nuclear physics topic in AQAA level physics. So in today's lesson, we're going to look at explaining at how a power station carries out fission safely. So if we've been successful and we've learned in today's lesson, we should be able to explain how a nuclear fission reactor works. Describe a thermal nuclear fission reactor and explain how a nuclear fission chain reaction is controlled, which links into the following part of the AQA A-level physics specification, 3.8.1.7 induced fission. So a nuclear reactor uses a controlled chain reaction to produce heat to produce steam for a generator. Now apart from the source of heat it works in the same way as a coal-fired power station. So if we look at the actual reactor vessel itself in the fission power station you can see that the nuclear fission process takes place in this steel vessel. Now we've got to consider the processes which take place inside this steel vessel because if we wish to understand the fission process in a fission generator we can then understand the processes inside a nuclear power station so as mentioned before nuclear fission is a chain reaction now for a chain reaction to occur at all a critical mass of fissile material is needed now critical mass is the minimum amount of mass needed for a sustained chain reaction to occur in a material so if we consider that as our definition for critical mass, why does, why does a critical mass exist at all in the fission process? Well, it's because the chain reaction takes place because neutrons released in the original fission event will then go on to encounter other nuclei and then cause them to fission as well. But some of the fission neutrons will escape out of the fuel rods without causing fission because they'll just not encounter another nucleus of uranium. So it's dependent on the surface area to mass ratio of the material because if it's too high there's a greater chance of the neutron escaping from the reactor without encountering a nucleus which it can then fission so the mass has to be increased to a certain amount to ensure that these neutrons when they're produced in the fission process will collide with another unstable nuclei so the critical mass is dependent on the surface area of our fuel rod so the critical mass occurs is not all the neutrons will hit a fissile uranium nucleus before escaping the rod. Now we've mentioned the fact that it's got to hit a fissile uranium nucleus. Well why is that? Well it's because the fuel rods in the reactor core contain different types of different types of uranium, different isotopes of uranium. Now naturally only uranium-235 will fission when it absorbs a neutron. Now natural uranium contains 1% uranium-235. So the greater the amount of uranium-235 the more fission that will occur but so the, there's a greater chance of a chain reaction developing in our reactor vessel. So physicists have developed enriched uranium to ensure a chain reaction is produced in a reactor. Now enriched uranium contains about 3% uranium-235 as opposed to 1% uranium-235 which is still a very small amount but it does take a long time to carry out the enrichment process. Interestingly a fission bomb contains about 50% uranium-235. Now many countries wish to develop the ability to produce enriched uranium however develop countries do not like to share how this is produced because the enriched uranium tends to be produced in secure locations in that country. Now we note that when we're doing the fission process we need to enrich uranium fuel until it reaches its critical mass because once it's reached its critical mass a sustained chain reaction can take place. Now as mentioned before how do we ensure the chain reaction stays critical and doesn't go super critical in its fission process? So there are three main features of a nuclear reactor in a power station which helps maintain a steady fission rate with a critical chain reaction in the reactor vessel. You've got the control rods, the coolant and the moderator. So we're now going to investigate how each component works. Now control rods in the reactor vessel absorb extra neutrons which keeps the chain reaction under control. The depths of the rods in the core can be changed to maintain a steady reaction rate. Now our control rods are generally made out of boron because they absorb excess neutrons neutrons and they actually become radioactive waste after the process. So control rods are needed to prevent a reactor core from going into nuclear meltdown. 
so control rods are required in nuclear power stations to prevent large-scale nuclear accidents. So in a reactor vessel, there are two types of rod. You've got your fuel rods, and these rods contain enriched uranium, which is found in the form of uranium oxide. Now these rods are where the fission process takes place. You've also got control rods, which are rods made from boron. These rods are where the fissile neutrons are absorbed. Now for every fission reaction, on average three neutrons are produced. So for a control chain reaction, only one neutron can be allowed to fission. So this means the control rod on average absorbs two out of every three neutrons. So for the reactor to transfer energy at a constant rate, each nuclear fission reaction must lead to one more fission reaction. Since each reaction gives out two or more, or neutrons have got to remove some of these extra neutrons. So like we said before, the control rod absorbs neutrons reduce the amount of nuclear fission processes occurring and making the power output of our nuclear power station constant. So it's important to note that the depth of the control rods in the core is automatically adjusted to keep the number of neutrons in the core constant so exactly one fission neutron per fission event on average goes on to produce further fission. So this condition keeps the rate of fission energy release constant. So it's important to note that we can lower our control rods further into the fuel rods to absorb more neutrons and further reduce the amount of fission. Now also as well, some neutrons leave the reactor interfering and some travel too fast while others are absorbed by uranium-238. So it's not an exact science that the control rod itself needs to absorb two out of every three. Now, if we need more neutrons, okay, we can raise our control rods further. So if the fission rate's dropping, we can actually pull our control rods out of the reactor vessel. Now, the emergency shutdown procedure of a nuclear power station is actually to fully insert the control rods into the reactor vessel. This will ensure all neutrons are absorbed and no further fission can take place. This will cause our chain reaction to go subcritical. It's also important to note that this will actually, this process of the control rod absorbing absorbing neutrons will make the control rod radioactive after use. So this makes the control rod nuclear waste which needs to be buried. So what is our factors that affect the choice of material use for control rod? It's the ability to absorb neutrons and having a high melting point because it gets very hot in the reactor vessel and you don't want it to melt. So the typical materials used are either boron or cadmium. Now the absorption of neutrons increases the number of neutrons in the boron nuclei and makes them unstable which makes them nuclear waste. The second thing we've got to look at is the coolant. Now water acts as a coolant in a reactor vessel. So the water molecules gain kinetic energy from the neutrons and the fuel rods and the water is pumped throughout the core and through seal pipes to and from a heat exchanger outside the core. So the role of the coolant is to carry heat okay, and exchange it into our, actual react into our actual power station. So the pressurizer and pump move the hot coolant to the heat exchanger and either hot coolant touches the pipes carrying cold water. Water. So the heat flows from the hot coolant to the cold water, turning our, our water into steam and leaving the coolant. The steam will then leave the reactor and turn the turbine as the coolant returns to the reactor. So fission fragments in the fission process transfer kinetic energy to coolant molecules via collisions. So the energy released via nuclear fission transfers via kinetic energy of the fission fragments. The fission fragments released via nuclear fission will then collide with the coolant molecules and this transfers energy from our fission fragments to our coolant molecules. Now the collisions are inelastic, however they do cause our coolant molecules to heat up. So firstly, this prevents the reactor core from overheating and causing a uranium meltdown. Now in older power stations, we tended to use our carbon dioxide molecules as the coolant, but in newer power stations, the coolant molecules are water molecules. Now the coolant needs to be very efficient at transferring heat, because not only does it stop our uranium from going into nuclear meltdown, but the heat from the reactor can also be used to make steam for powering electricity generated turbines. So what factors affect the choice of material for our coolant? Well, it must be able to carry large amounts of heat, be either a gas or a liquid, be non-corrosive, non-flammable, and a poor neutron absorber, so it's not going to become radioactive. So typical materials can either be carbon dioxide or water. Now the final thing we need to consider is the moderator. Now fission neutrons are slowed down by collisions with atoms in the water molecule, uh, atoms of the water molecules. Now this is needed as fast neutrons do not cause further fission of uranium. So too fast and the neutrons smash straight through the nuclear 
nucleus and too slow, the neutrons will not be accepted by the nucleus. So the water is a moderator because it slows down the fast neutrons to just the right velocity. So if the neutron is going too fast or too slow, it will go through the uranium. It just needs to be going at just the right velocity. So fission neutrons need to be slowed down significantly to cause further fission of uranium-235 nuclei, otherwise they'd be traveling too fast to be accepted by the nucleus. They would literally just collide off the nucleus. So a neutron, which is traveling at a speed to be absorbed by a uranium nucleus, is called a thermal neutron. Now, why is this? It's because the neutron is a thermal equilibrium with its surroundings. Now, choosing a moderator with a similar mass to the neutrons um, allows, it, allows, allows that moderator to be more efficient at slowing down the neutrons. Now, as we mentioned before, if the neutron has too much energy, it will pass straight through the nucleus. If the neutron has too little energy, it will pass away from the nucleus. So the neutron needs to be slowed to just the right speed to be accepted by the nucleus. Now the moderator slows down the neutron by colliding with it. So the neutrons are slowed down by collisions with other molecules in the reactor. Now this is normally water as found in older reactors or liquid graphite in our new reactors. If the reactor core had a vacuum surrounding the fuel rods, this chain reaction just would not work because the neutrons would be traveling too quickly. Now each collision between the neutron and the moderator molecule is an elastic collision. So this means the kinetic energy and the momentum of the fissile neutron is transferred to the moderator molecules. So the transfer of the momentum and kinetic energy to the moderator molecules heats up the moderator. So it's very similar in action to that of the coolant. So this is how in many examples the moderator and the coolant in our nuclear fission reactor are in fact the same substance. So like mentioned before, in older power stations the moderator molecules are graphite, whilst in newer power stations the moderator molecules are water molecules. Now assuming that the collision of a moderator particle and a neutron is perfectly elastic, you know that the kinetic energy and the momentum are both conserved. Now if we assume the moderator particle is stationary before the collision, we can write out the following equation. So we've got our mass of our neutron, our mass of our moderator, our mass and the mass that stay constant before and after the collisions, and we've got our velocity of our neutron and our velocity of our moderator before and after the collision. No, before the collision, the moderator is stationary, so the velocity will be zero. So if momentum is conserved, we can say that the momentum of the neutron, because the moderator has no momentum before the collision, because it's not moving, is equal to the, mo the momentum of the neutron plus the momentum of the moderator. And it's the same idea for the kinetic energy, that the kinetic energy of the neutron before, because remember the moderator before has no kinetic energy because it's not moving, will equal the kinetic energy of the neutron plus the kinetic energy of the moderator after the collision. Now with these two equations, we can use these equations to find terms for the velocity of the neutron after the collision and the velocity of the moderator after the collision. So if we sub in our terms, we can see that this on the screen is the following equation for the neutron after after the collision in terms of its velocity before the collision. And by that same logic, we can also find the velocity of the moderator after the collision in terms of velocities of the neutron before it. Now, what's interesting to note is if we look at these two equations and we say that the mass of the moderator particle is equal to the mass of a neutron, well, actually our final velocity of the neutron will be zero meters per second. Because we can say that it's gonna be the velocity of the neutron after the collision is m minus m over m plus m times by the velocity before, which when we work it all through, m minus m equals zero, so we'll cancel it all through, so our final velocity of our neutron would equal zero. And also, if we look at the velocity of the moderator, it'll actually have the final, it'll have the uh, velocity of the of the neutron before the collision, because we can say that it's going to be 2m over m plus m, which is just 2m again. They cancel through, times that by vn equals vn. So this indicates to us that all of the kinetic energy and the momentum will be transferred to the moderator particle. So the more similar the masses of the neutron and the moderator, the more kinetic energy and momentum will be transferred from the neutron to the moderator.
so the moderator should be slowing the neutrons to about 2200 meters per second to be absorbed by our uranium nuclei so the mass of the moderator needs to be around the same size as the mass of the neutron now this entire reactor is placed inside a steel vessel why do we do this well the steel vessel can withstand high temperatures and pr the pressures needed and produced by the fission events also the steel vessel can absorb beta radiation and reduce gamma radiation slash free neutrons produced in the fission events but we also surround our steel vessel with thick concrete walls why is that well the thick concrete walls will reduce the gamma radiation and the free neutrons even more so than the steel vessel would so what can we summarize from today's lesson Fission induced by thermal neutrons, we consider the possibility of a chain reaction in critical mass. We should know the functions of the moderator, the control rod, and the coolant in a thermal nuclear reactor, and we can detail uh, we can detail what's going on with all these particular ideas. We should have an understanding of a simple mechanical model of moderation by elastic collisions and factors affecting the choice of materials for the moderator, the control rod, and the coolant, with examples of materials used for these particular functions. So, if we've been successful and we've learnt in today's lesson, we can explain how a nuclear fission reactor works. We can describe a thermal nuclear fission reactor and then explain how a nuclear fission chain reaction is controlled. So I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson on induced fission, which is part of the nuclear physics topic in AQA A-level physics. Thank you very much for watching and have a lovely day.